if you want um, more on um, the Holy Spirit that I was talking about, uh, read Matthew 12, 30-32, and read it in its context. Um, so. so this is the guilt balance. Um, this is taken almost directly from Bill Gothard. Um, people always seek to justify themselves for the sake of comfort and pride. Okay, whenever you're in a conflict with someone, bank on everyone, including yourself, justifying themselves so that they feel better, okay? As a result, both the mind and the emotions will affirm a bad response, which at first feels easier, but actually weighs you down in conflict. So basically what that means is, logically it'll make sense. Emotions, mentally, it'll, it'll feel, it'll, with your heart, it'll, feel, it'll, it'll, it'll make sense, it'll, it'll you think you'll be right in, in your bad response. You'll think this is the easiest solution. It, it feels better. But throughout the course of time, this will actually make you, um, not only bring you into more conflict throughout time, but also weigh you down. Um, so if you look at the left of your screen, it shows the, the guilt blame is equal. The feelings of guilt for his attitudes or actions towards you are equal with the blame towards you for the things you have done to him. In other words, he's okay with justifying what he's doing because you were also wrong. So when you apologize, you have to realize that with no blame to justify and balance past wrongs, the guilt intensifies. See, because you've apologized, there's no more blame. So they may not still, uh, still may not uh, forgive you immediately, but there will be a guilt. And if he continues to not forgive you, um, there'll be even, even uh, worse, um, even worse. Um, punishment for them. It, it, it's hard for them. So I, I will say one thing. Um, you know, we cannot enjoy people who, wicked people, getting what they deserve. We cannot enjoy people get, uh, people who have wronged us getting what they deserve. Um, Romans uh, 12, 20 through 21 says, as it is, there are many parts but one body that I cannot say to the I'm sorry, I'm in Corinthians. Maybe that didn't sound right. Romans 12, 22, 21. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, some people get really confused about this. What Paul is doing is he's using an extreme case um, of really dramatic irony. Okay, For those who want evil on their enemies, they never see it. But for those who genuinely want evil, to see restoration of their enemies, and, and, they, and, they, and they genuinely feel for them, and they genuinely love them. So you notice how verse 17, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And before that, it says, um, Do not be proud. Um, and before that, it says, Love must be sincere. See what I mean? He's not just saying a bunch of random things. These are things that connect. And so in, in loving our enemies, and in genuinely wanting what's best for them, and being hurt when something bad happens to them um, we actually make it where it convicts them like I showed you on the chart here the guilt and blame balance is is, is undone um, and they feel more guilt so they feel they feel very um, um, they feel uh, like there's heaping like there's burning coals on their head okay but then also um, the Lord will judge those people who do not forgive. I mentioned this before, you have to forgive people. But the thing is, if you are happy when they are punished, if it brings you joy that they are punished, if um, you uh, read this and you're, oh yes, I'm going to do right so that they'll get what's coming to them, you're doing it wrong. See what I mean? It's, those, it's, those, it's the enemies that you don't want evil to come on. See what I mean? If you want the evil to come on them, you didn't really love them. See what I mean? <laughs> um, and so it's, it's irony. When you don't want something bad to happen to them, that's when something bad will happen. When you do want something bad to happen, uh, that's when it won't happen. Um, so do not repay anyone evil for evil. Well, they were wrong too. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. 
is if it is possible, so as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As much as it depends on you, stop pointing the finger at everybody else. If you are in a conflict, do what you can to bring peace. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge our pay, says the Lord. In other words, it's none of your business how God handles those people who don't forgive you. It's none of your business how God chooses to judge people. That's what he's saying here. It's none of your business. It's none of your concern. You are not the judge. You are not the person who's who's going to be uh, bringing this um, on these people. God's got it under control, and He doesn't need you. He doesn't need your help to to guide how He how He corrects people or how He how He deals with conflict. He doesn't need your help for that. Leave room for God to do it, because he, he, he said, "It is mine. Um, vengeance is mine. I will repay, not I will use you to repay." But what you are to do as a as, as the Christian is you are to love your enemy and then show that love by serving your enemy. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. See what I mean? It's not good enough to say that you love someone, but then not serve them. If you love someone, you will serve them. Okay, it's that simple. Jesus told this to, to Peter. Do you love um, Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Um, so, um... Do not overcome evil, but overcome evil. Um, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what we're talking about here. Continue to love and do good for people, and genuinely hurt for those who are caught in sin. Genuinely hurt for them. Um, and rest assured, God will judge unrighteousness. But keep in mind that James mentions that that if you harbor this in, in your heart, the judgment will also be poured out on you too. See what I mean? Um, he says that about, um, you know, uh, and they're, they're nor towards the end in chapter 4 somewhere, or 5, I think. 5, 7, I think. Um, but anyways, um, so genuinely love people, especially those people, especially those people who are, um, who are, who are your enemies. If you persist in a conflict, however, even after an apology, this is what will happen. We'll continue in, in conflict with the person, but then we'll just throw out an apology. Look, I... I'm sorry that what I did offended you. See what I mean? Even after that half apology, the root offense will be masked by years of smaller but seemingly more important things. This happens a lot in marriage. When, you know, we've been married 20 or so years and all of a sudden they realize that they fight all the time. We never have anything good to say, to, to say about each other. We just fight all the time. Seemingly important things that just build up through the years that actually had one root cause. See what I mean? Um... And usually, not in in divorce and stuff. There isn't one right person, one wrong person. Usually, um, there'll be one person who's sixty percent wrong, another person's forty percent wrong. But they're more wrong. But you're also wrong too. Even if that other person is ninety nine percent wrong and you are one percent wrong, you are still wrong. See how that works? So, but here's the thing: when we resent someone, we actually are fighting against ourselves because we become who we resent. In in construction, when you would hit a nail. With a hammer, if you looked at your finger, you would hit your finger. If you looked at, your, at the nail, you would hit the nail. You hit what you aim for. Okay, so if we're focusing on God, we're going to hit God. If we're focusing on the person we hate, we're gonna hit that person that we hate, probably literally too. Um, but it, 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 for instance, when we when we when we sin. If you focus on the sin, you're going to do it again. But if you focus on God and on his goodness and on his faithfulness, you won't do it again. So, if you look right here, here is you. And you can either cho choose a wrong focus or you can fo and choose a right focus. Okay? So here is God and here is the one you, you resent. Here is the, here's the steps to becoming the person that you, that you don't like. And this is a wrong focus. You have contempt for the person. There it is. You have contempt for that person. Um, this is where you react to their offense. Okay? Maybe you didn't even do anything wrong at first. They did something wrong. But then you react to it. There is where contempt sets in. Then you have concentration. This is where you just sit there and stew about it. Strengthening wrong emotional focus by continually reviewing the offense. In other words, I'm right because because what they did was so wrong and, 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 and this and that and this and that other thing. And then there's conformity. Developing similar basic attitudes and attempt to not act the same. See, in our heart, 
we are the same, even though we may do things differently in action. Okay, um, and we'll talk about more about this a specific example in the next slide. Um, so here's how uh, the correct focus. You, when we are saved, we are born again. Okay, then comes concentration and conformity. Okay, strengthening emotional focus toward God by comparing His actions and attitudes with our actions and attitudes. Comparing ourselves with God, not by ourselves or by those among us. So then there's conformity. Um, concentration on Christ and His Word allows His Spirit to produce basic change. Now I'm going to move this out of the way so you can see this, this down here too. Um, so concentrating on Christ and His Word allows His Spirit to produce ba basic change. Um, and this is how this looks. When we are wronged, we focus on God uh, and we forgive the person and um, we... Um, compare ourselves and our actions to God rather than justifying ourselves. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, um, And we all uh, who with unveiled faces contemplate the, uh, the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Um, so, um, we uh, need to make sure that our concentration is on God and his, what he did, does and says and what his attitude is in doing things. Um, and then uh, by doing that, we will be changed. So Mark 12, 30 says that the first uh, commandment, the first and greatest commandment is to love God uh, with your whole um, you know, body, strength, soul, mind, all these different things. And then it says to love people as, your, uh, as yourself. To establish our concentration conformity to Christ, we need to, okay let me explain we need to fully love God above everything in life above our materialism above everything and in so doing we establish our concentration and conformity to Christ and when we do this then we are able to, to fulfill the second command the second greatest command which is to love our neighbor as ourself so see what I mean by doing that it leads to the other thing so oftentimes people say but I can't love this person you focus on loving God and, and then the concentration and conformity to God will come. And then, in doing that, you will eventually learn to love that person. So, when we react against someone, we begin measuring ourselves by their actions, which produces pride in us. I'm not that bad. I didn't do this. Did you see what I mean? We're, we're reassuring ourselves. Rather than addressing the situation, we're building pride in ourselves. Selfishness, okay? This is producing pride, it's producing selfishness. We're only concerned about ourselves. In fact, oftentimes when we're in conflict with someone, we won't even see other people's needs. We will only see our own needs. And this also produces bitterness. And bitterness, once again, once bitterness takes root, it's going to expand to other areas of your life. You're going to be just a nasty person because you weren't able to forgive that one person. And there'll be more bitterness and more bitterness. Others will then see in us the same thing we condemned the other person for. Okay, they will see in us the exact same thing, and they'll say, "You're a hypocrite. You're doing the exact same thing." And we'll say, "No, we're not. No, we're not. Not realizing that the that the attitude is the same." Okay, Second Corinthians ten twelve says, "We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise." Okay, once again, um, because you'll always be better than someone that's just a dumb dumb person to compare yourself to here's another example once again let me move this out of the way um, so here is you right here okay um, and and this is you saying I'll never be like my father there's a standard of comparison okay um, and it, it doesn't have to be a father it can be anyone really and here's your father down here he was a he was drunk he neglected you he was unfaithful to, to your mom here he is okay I'll never be like him but this person is not realizing that there's two sides, okay, two sides of the focus, and you become who you resent. I I, I was reading one story, and 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 a teenager teenage daughter said, "Oh, I hate my mom," and the teacher said, "Well, that's a shame because in ten years you're gonna be just like her." <gasps> yeah, because you become the one who you resent. Yeah. So this is the person, the onlooker, who says, you're just like your father. Well, how is that going to be? I'm, I don't drink. I don't neglect my, my family. I'm not unfaithful. Yes, but in the root attitude, the other side of the spectrum, you are. Your visible actions are different, but your root attitude is different. You are bitter towards your father. He was bitter, which caused him to drink. Um, you are selfish in that you don't realize that you need to forgive, for not just for his 
um, not just for the relationship, but for your own sake, you need to forgive. Remember what I said about the authority. You do this for your own sake. When we do bad, stupid things, when we do, when we do wicked things and justify ourselves, we are hurting ourselves. Now, obviously, we do um, sin against God, and when we do hurt other people as well. I'm not trying to make it me focused, but you know how stupid is that that we do these things that make us feel better, that make us more selfish, and then we claim to not be selfish. I think you see what I'm saying. Um, so then. Um, he had a problem with pride. You have a problem with pride, evidently, because you won't forgive him. Um, Self-centeredness. You're only concerned about how he wronged you. What you see in others is usually in you. That person's so prideful, they're do 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 It's usually the same thing that is in you. Okay. Sometimes you can't see your problem because you're too close to it. A counselor once told me told me like this. Let me put it where you can see it on my sound screen. Here's my face here. Okay. And here's that something that I'm overly concerned with. And I'm too close to it, and I can't see anything else because I'm too close to it. Does that make sense? Um, find friends who will tell you the truth and not tickle your ears. There's a difference between the truth and somebody just tickling your ears. You become who you resent. Okay. So here is correct reactions, okay? This is how you correctly respond to the situations. Okay. The energizing power needed to live the Christian life is called grace. Okay? That is grace. This is mentioned in a few places, which I'll turn to, but just roll with me on this, okay? God gives a certain amount of grace to everyone, but the proud resist the grace they get and lose God's power. How do they resist? By um, allowing uh, attitudes to... Uh, holding on to bad attitudes by... Um, um, by responding with wickedness, by when temptation comes their way, giving in rather than fighting it. Um, this this squelches the grace. Whereas every time that we obey God and, and, and how he directs us in his word, we get a new measure of grace, okay? So how do you get more? James 4, 6. Whenever we are humbled, we receive at that moment an added measure of God's grace. In other words, God will bring by situations that further humble us, okay? And the moment that we are humble we become prideful. <laughs> so it's a kind of, kind of constant pri process. It's something that we never arrive. We're always seeking after God. Um, 1 Corinthians 15. And never think that you're so strong in God that you will not be tempted in something. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And Titus. <coughs> Um, Titus 2, 11 through 12 says, um, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, self upright, and godly lives in this present age. Okay. So, um, this is how it works. Here we are, okay, and somebody offends us. If we give them a right response... And while they're continuing to be nasty to us, we receive a new measure of grace. This allows us to, to face more things in the future and to depend on God to a greater degree. So, continued right response, okay, continually giving them that right response and loving them and doing what's best for them strengthens the quality in you, which then brings healing to the offender. This person who struggles with this thing, you now cause them healing. They tell others, which gives you opportunity to witness, those pe um, and those people's achievements then brings joy to you. See what I mean? Because you are the root cause of all these things. Um, but you have to continually, continually um, show this person the right response. Okay? So let's break this down. Brings good qualities in you. You're going to learn from this. You're going to grow from this. You're going to get new measures of grace. You're going to be able to um, walk in a, in a stronger walk with God. You're going to establish more uh, godly um, habits in your life. Um, and this brings healing to the person, okay? But here's here's you. And somebody wrongs you, and you react. You, you react against them, even if you were not even the cause of this thing. So then what happens is a barrier gets put up between you guys. Barrier to further communication. Okay? They report to their friends. And people, oh, well, I tried to apologize. There's a barrier there. Sometimes you have to endure some rough persecution before you're able to uh, to make amends with someone. Once again, 
Love bears no memory of the wrong suffered, okay? They report to their friends. His friends now resent you. New barriers are formed between lots of people. Now, you are now the enemy of lots of other people because you wronged this person. Um, trust that that person will gossip about you because people who are wronged, people who are hurt, hurt other people. Um, yes, it is unfair, but Christianity is not about fairness, but rightness. You cannot expect the world to act like Christ, much less the church, who is filled with people like you. We must give grace and mercy to ourselves and others. In light of this, apologizing becomes even more important. I highly encourage you to pause this and really give this some serious thought. Um, especially since you will justify a lot of your stupidity by what is right and what is not right. Um, learn to get along with those who irritate you, parents or authorities, spouses, acquaintances. I, I knew one person who they hated their parents, and then they got married, and their spouse <laughs> was just like their parents. See, God has a way of, of, of working in us, and uh, God has a way of doing things for our benefit and, and, and for... Um, yeah. Every person we heal brings a new door into their lives where we can impact them great, to a greater degree, and they can impact us to a greater degree. Those we offend become closed doors to opportunities for us, not just within their lives, but closed doors within jobs, within within finances, within, um, within uh, relationships with other people. See, it's not so simple as, as, as just impacting those who, um, who are directly involved. So how do you forgive someone? First off, prayer is a priority. Ask for grace, ask for wisdom, ask for forgiveness. Um, remind, ask God to remind you how much grace he's given you, and that will help you to give grace to that person. You wronged God, the creator of everything. How much more should you not be? Should you not hold on to whatever you feel like justifies your attitude? Also, step back from the problem, but briefly. Don't step back from it for too long. But step back long enough to get your bearings, okay? Sometimes a clear mind will give us, well, clarity. Um... Pray for their well-being. Instead of gossiping about them, pray for their well-being. Okay? Uh, not like that song, I pray your brakes go out on a downward hill, <laughs> or a, a, um, when you're driving downhill or whatever. Not like that. Pray for their well-being. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would guide them. I pray that you'd be with them and be a comfort to them. I pray that you would remove sickness from them. So, I mean, this goes against everything that you're going to feel. Also, worship God. Just put on some worship music go in the, in the worship services. Really worship, cry out to God. Um, stay in prayer every day. And I'm not going to tell you a specific time, but just get in there. Okay, Get in there. Pray and don't don't get up until you you finish what you've accomplished. And then keep going back every day. Uh, don't separate yourself. Oftentimes when we're hurt, we try to isolate ourselves and, and think that that makes it, will make everything better. It makes things worse. Do you feel alone be, um, because you are alone? Sometimes I talk to people and I just feel so alone. I feel like, you know, whatever. Are you separating yourselves? Sometimes you will feel alone because you are alone. So think about that. Um, don't separate yourself from, from the group. Stop justifying your attitude. But they did this. Just stop justifying it. Doesn't matter. Just let it go. But they did. It doesn't matter. Let it go. Combat thoughts with scripture. This is exactly what Jesus did when, oh, excuse me, when the, uh, when Satan was, excuse me, when Satan was tempting him, he combated it with scripture. Don't allow those false thoughts to take root. And my mom used to say, don't give Satan a foothold. Well, I'm not giving a foothold. I'm just holding on to a little bit thing here. You're giving Satan a foothold. Decide what to think about. And Philippians walks you through this. It walks you through not being anxious about giving, um, surrendering to God, and then it tells you to control your thinking. Read all of Philippians 4 rather than just the part that says um, about think on the good things. Read what comes before that. That is how you think on those good things. So um, think about blessings. Think about the blessings you've received. Think about the blessings you could do for them. Think about positive aspects of their character. And then also... Is your complaint based on reality, or did your mi mind run wild? Sometimes when we're offended, our minds take us to all kinds of different places. But that doesn't mean that it's actually true. Don't only look at the bad in the situation or in the person. Okay? See others' pain and others' point of view. Put yourself in their shoes. 
Do it quickly, don't postpone fixing your attitude. And when it takes root, it only gets harder and not easier. Um, it may take a while. Don't expect immediate resolution when it took you years to get in this place. Strong sin doesn't just appear in our lives, it's a process. Sin gradually is allowed in, and then it is usually a process of gradually getting it out. Most people, when they are saved, are not instantly set free from drugs and, and sex and all these different things. Um, and an and I want to clarify something. An addiction is anything that has control over you. Food can be an addiction for you. I don't, I don't care what, what psychologist says. This is what the word says. Nothing should have ownership over you except for Christ. Okay? Um, so how to correct uh, someone. Uh, and this is the last here. The, I have two more signs. How to correct someone. First, check your attitude. Make sure that you're doing this with the right attitude for the right reasons. You're doing it for their benefit, not for yourself, not to make yourself feel better. Do it alone. Whenever you go to someone to correct what they're doing, make sure that it's just between you and them and it won't be embarrassing. Don't delay for months. Um, you know, if you bring something, oh, well, you last January you did, well, that was a long time ago. See what I mean? Just drop those things. If it's been so long, just, just drop it. Also, ask yourself, is it a molehill? Am I making a mountain out of this and it really isn't that big of a deal? And also, is it something that the Bible tells me to um, rebuke someone for? Because sometimes we'll do something like, you don't need to dress like that in church and do, do, do. And we'll go off on these rant, rant, rants and it's like, well, okay, hold on. That's not your, even your place to do that. Um, make sure it's worth mentioning. Make sure it's your responsibility. You don't reprimand your father, for instance. Oh, but my father did. It doesn't matter. You keep your mouth shut. That's your authority. Even if you're married, you still don't, you still don't disrespect them. Um, be clear and concise about what they did. Don't drag it out. Make it make it very clear. Make it concise. Make it make make it quick. In and out. Don't don't drag it out. Don't make them feel dumb. Because oftentimes when we try to recommend somebody, oh well, they didn't listen to me. Because you said it with the wrong attitude. Leave room for the Holy Spirit to move in that person. Leave room for the Holy Spirit to to convict that person. Okay. Um, if it's something that absolutely has to be said, uh, by all means do it. But make sure that it's something biblical and something that's actually needed to. Um, and also leave room for the Holy Spirit. Stay on target when you're doing it. Mention what, what one thing they did. Don't have a list of things, okay? Mention that one thing and why it was wrong. If they needed explained why it was wrong. And only do those things, if you have multiple things, only start, with the, start with the thing that's of most, um, of most importance. Um, and and say, say them uh, quickly, but no, don't not like you're attacking them in rapid fire. Okay? You can say the same thing in two different ways, and one way causes a problem, one way causes a resolution. And let people see that you're genuine, that you actually care for them. Okay? People respond when you know them, respond better when you know them. If you try to just correct somebody who you don't know, it's not going to happen. So what helps with this is if you make a list of everything that you think that you did, they did wrong, then check your attitude, and then check those things with scripture. And, yeah. But I will tell you this, if you wait too long and someone's uh, starting to enter into sin and, and you don't address it until it adds up to a lot of bigger things, sometimes th th by that point they'll be so caught into the sin that they won't be, re be able to accept what you're telling them. But sometimes we hop down people's throat too quickly. Remember, if someone's just barely saved, you should definitely give them way more grace. Just hold off. Hold back the double barrels. So, one last note. One of the quickest ways to get a teenager to distance themselves from you is to nitpick. Um, there was this, this teenage girl that, that, that she was wearing a dress trying to present herself well. And somebody hopped down her throat because she didn't sit right in the dress. I mean, yes, it was, you know, obviously not a good thing how she was sitting, but she didn't know, and she was genuinely trying to do the right thing. So even though she did the wrong thing, she her intentions were good, and the person could have taken that into account and just said, hey, your tushy is showing. You know, in private, it didn't have to be something that she said it in front of people like that. So by nitpicking, the person, the person pushed that teenager away and caused that teenager to not respect them and to distance themselves and to not try so hard in the future. See? Notice the positive in the person. Notice the positive. Especially in teenagers, they're already insecure. They don't need you adding to it. Uh, they aren't going to do things the way you want. This is just a fact of life. Um, you can try to help them with your experience and try to pull, uh, keep them from mistakes by your experience. 
Sometimes people just feel the burning desire to make their own mistakes. I, I can't explain it. It's just something dumb that teenagers like to do. Okay? So realize that they aren't going to do things the way you want all the time. And that's not necessarily bad. People, Kids don't have to do things exactly like you did them to be right. Okay? Um, and they will need to make their own choices. No matter what, at the end of the day, we are teaching our kids to make their own decisions, not to constantly know how to, how to make our decision, but how to, how to make their own decision. Because what happens when you die and you're not there to, 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 to dictate their life anymore? They're not going to know. What happens when they, when they get out to the real world and they don't know how to, how to deal with it? So they go to public school, for instance, and they're faced with all these different things they don't know how to deal with. Because you didn't teach them how to make decisions, you ta taught them how to obey you. You should teach them how to obey you. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying anything against that. What I'm saying is you need to teach them how to be an adult. They learn how to be an adult by you, by experience with you, by the things that you say. Um, so guide and direct, but more so pray. It is important that you give your child direction, but pray for them and pray with them, and let them know that you're all that that that, that you take your spiritual walk. Um, um, seriously. So uh, let them see you pray. Let them see you read your Bible. It's not a bad thing. Um, and but at the end of the day, they will resent you for protecting them from harm. At the end of the day, if you if you always try to coddle your child, they will resent you. I can't explain this, and I'm not necessarily condoning this. I'm just giving you the fact of how it is. Your child will resent you when you constantly try to try to keep them from things. Only give wisdom at key times or if asked. If you're constantly trying to give wisdom, your child's not going to hear. That's not wisdom. That's shooting out knowledge. Okay, um, Knowledge without love is, is pointless. Wisdom tells us how to apply knowledge. Okay, So, um, always remember that they will resent you, so do things sparingly, do things wisely, do things tactfully. And remember that teenagers are new people every day. They've got so many new hormones that they're just figuring out. Um, and don't think, don't take things too seriously. And when I, let me clarify that. Your teenager will probably at one time say, oh, I hate you. Well, don't take it to heart. Just don't take it to heart. Uh, teenagers, once again, are new people every day. And it doesn't matter what you did in the past. Just try to be a good parent today. And that's all you really can do. Um, and obviously pray for them. And let them know that you're praying for them. Um, but anyways... Um, never forget that, that they will resent you for that, um, and they will want you to, to, to allow them trust. And this is how you do that. Build trust with them. Um, give them opportunities to earn your trust, and then as they do, give them more opportunities. But don't hop down their throat every time that they make the slightest mistake. What's going to happen is you're going to squelch them. Remember what Paul writes. Parents, don't drive your child to anger. Okay? Remember that. Um, and remember to treat your child like they're part of your team. They are not the center of your world, and they are not um, an inconvenience. They are part of the team of the family. Okay, So I hope that that brought clarity there. Um, next lesson is about, if there's any questions, post them below, uh, is about lifestyle, Christian lifestyle. What should I do and what should I not do?